With three days left to spare before classes officially start, we witness how these jocks mess around, party all night, and form relationships in a messy, irrational, yet somehow natural turn of events. Everybody Wants Some is a feel-good movie set in Texas in 1980. Director Richard Linklater introduces us to an uncanny and rather bizarre team of college baseball players. The movie opens up with Jake Bradford, a college freshman driving his way to his dormitory on campus. Jamming to the classic My Sharona, we get a peek on Jake's interests and his luggage, which mostly consists of a crate of vinyl records. He moves into the baseball team's dilapidated house three days before classes start. As Jake inspects the contents of the fridge in the kitchen, upperclassmen McReynolds and Roper make their way downstairs. McReynolds greets Jake with initial hostility, voice out his dislike for pitchers. Jake made it to the college baseball team as a pitcher, apparently. However, he doesn't linger on McReynolds' sentiment and moves upstairs to unpack and get settled. Upstairs, Jake meets some more of the baseball team's members, Willoughby, Finn, Plummer, and Dale Douglas. Dale shows him to his room, following the telephone cord. There, Jake meets his new roommate in his all-pantsless glory, Billy Autry whom the upperclassmen nicknamed Buter Perkins. Jake immediately gets pulled along the baseball team's antics. Roper, Finn, Plummer, Jake, and Dale are surprisingly in sync as they sing along loudly to rap music playing in the car. They drive around campus, inviting random girls to the baseball house for a party tonight. Finally, they make it to the Fox, a popular bar nearby campus. Jake buys the boys the first round of drinks. Some more of the baseball team's members now show up, Brumley, Nez, and Coma. As they goof around, teasing Brumley's attempt at growing a mustache and his corny lines, they also talk about the new lineup of the team, the freshman players, and Jay Niles, also known as the second coming of Nolan Ryan. Evening comes and the baseball team are gathered in one of the baseball house's common rooms. Coach introduces the team to the freshman players, Ty Plummer, Catcher, Alex Brumley, Outfield, Jake Bradford, and Billy Autry, both pitchers. Coach announces they also have transfers, Charlie Willoughby from California and Jay Niles from Detroit. The baseball team has two houses donated by the government. With eight jocks living under one roof, things can get rowdy. Coach lays down two house rules, no bringing alcohol in the house and no bringing girls upstairs to their rooms. Wines and complaints echo from the team, but their coach does not budge. Concluding the meeting, McReynolds announces that the voluntary matches over the weekend is a mandatory play, especially for the freshmen. College students are meant to go beyond the limits and break rules, and break the house rules they did. Right after the team meeting, the jocks dress up in print button-ups and jeans to dance the night away at the sound machine. The upperclassmen ease Jake and the rest of the freshmen into the party culture of universities. Riding on varsity scholarship, the baseball team exploit their incentive of free drinks at the bar. The baseball team mingles with fellow college students, drinking and jiving on the dance floor all night long. Dale makes it a point to give Jake an overview of Finn's social skills to get ladies to listen to every word he says. The duo eventually makes their way to Val and Michelle. After the mandatory introductions, Michelle promptly pulls Dale to dance to her favorite song. Val and Jake follow suit, getting to know each other while dancing. Not long after, the party moves to the baseball house. 80s club music fills the common room and college boys and girls are alive and thriving, dancing around with drinks in hand. At this point, the coach's rules are thrown out the window. Every member of the baseball team finds ways and places to get down with their chosen lady of the night. The next day, the house is all but cleared of the baseball jocks loitering around. Billy heads back home to soothe his girlfriend's pregnancy scare, but not before his teammates excessively call him Buter Perkins and offer their rather backhanded show of support. Meanwhile, the campus is buzzing with students in true university fashion. With only two days before classes begin, student organizations are preparing for registration and orientation for freshmen and new applicants. Dale and Finn show Jake and Plummer around, sharing tips on how to get by classes and impress ladies with their majors. Jake's transition to the college lifestyle doesn't stop at partying. While some members of the team are busy playing basketball and throwing bad bets, Willoughby invites Jake to smoke a weed joint with him in his room. The group eventually moves to a game arcade, showing off their prowess, or rather poor skills, at pool, pinball machines, video games, and arcade soccer. The movie shares generous glimpses of the weird, amusing, and equally disgusting moments of living together with seven other jocks in one house. From judging tastes in clothes, to rummaging through a housemate's possessions without permission, Jake experiences it all. On his second night living with the baseball team, he finds himself yet again at the sound machine, making poor attempts of striking up a conversation with the girls. On the other hand, the upperclassmen are forced to play nice and nod along to Jay Mal's exaggerated stories about being a pro prospect. They share a collective sigh of relief when the bowl-cut brunette leaves to get his manly drink. In one way or another, Niles gets into trouble at the bar for making a fuss about his drink. A fight breaks in the club, and despite their dislike for Niles, 
Jake and the rest of the guys come to his rescue. The baseball team gets kicked out of the club. Niles gets lectured for his rude behavior and causing a totally avoidable situation. Jake and Finn watch from the sidelines, amused at the team's tribal pack mentality for defending their selfish teammate. Despite getting kicked out of the disco, the team quickly bounce back, leaving Niles out of the new plan. They head home for a quick wardrobe change to match the cowboy ambiance and feel at their new target, guaranteed wholesome. The jocks do their own thing over at the new bar. Jake and Willoughby even share a philosophical conversation about the strangeness of playing baseball for themselves, and not for other people's expectations. Soon after, everybody gets pulled into dancing along to the cowboy classic Cotton Eye Joe. The next day entails another round of unlimited freedom. The players are either busy playing basketball in the living room or watching Glenn lose his cool for losing at ping pong with Jake. Glenn hates losing, chucking his paddle towards Jake and breaking it in the process. Not long after, Jake, Dale, and Plummer are gathered in Willoughby's room, smoking a blunt. They try to see who can smoke the most, which unsurprisingly is Willoughby. They pass the blunt around, listening to Willoughby philosophize music and telepathy. The baseball house is undeniably full of competition here and there. Jake takes note of this as they come down from their highs and join the rest of the team downstairs. Nez is getting his knuckles beat up in a knuckle flick face-off with Brumley. Finn heartily comments these silly competitions always reveal whether a person is a competitor, a gamer, or a quitter. And what's college without a little identity crisis? While Jake, Coma, Finn, and Plummer are out on a walk. They bump on Dustin, Jake's old friend from high school. Jake used to play ball with Justin, who now lives the punk lifestyle. Justin invites Jake to a show tonight, who also pulls along his rather hesitant teammates. At the show, Jake experiences what we all know as culture shock. After going out to dance and party for consecutive nights, Jake comments he feels like a phony, going through an identity crisis in a punk show. Finn, despite being out of his element himself, laughs and shares his wisdom on how socializing is all about camouflage. They and the rest of the baseball team eventually get hyped up with the show's energy and they join in the mosh pit. Back at the baseball house, the players are gearing up for another house party. Before the party could start, Jake slips out to leave a flower and a note to the auburn-haired girl in room 307 at the apartment block. She initially took a liking to Jake during their rowdy drive around campus during Jake's first day. The freshman returns to the house and the party is in full swing. Everyone is having their moment at the party, ignorant of the consequences of their actions. We see ladies playing naked twister, guys playing golf on the roof, some mud wrestling action, and sledding on mattresses down the stairs. The next day, the plot finally unfurls among this ragtag bunch of college jocks. Plummer wakes up Jake, saying a girl is calling for him on the phone. It was the auburn-haired girl, who we come to know as Beverly. Jake's interest in Beverly is seemingly reciprocated, as they converse playfully on the phone. They agree to meet up in person later that day, both hurrying to clean up as they end their call. Finn attempts to give him dating advice, which Jake blatantly ignores as he hurries to Beverly's apartment. The two immediately click, sharing their wariness about being good in their own fields, baseball for Jake and performing arts for Beverly. They take a stroll outside, eating cold treats. Beverly invites Jake to a costume party at Oz, where most theater majors live. Jake shares the baseball team's first practices later in the afternoon, but is interested in showing up at the party. The baseball team gathers up in the locker rooms, playing shenanigans at every player who comes in. They move out and warm up on the field and finally get serious about baseball. However, the coach calls on Willoughby to get off the field. Willoughby smiles wryly at the rest of the team, who are confused about the turn of events. Things get heated up as Jay Niles one-ups the team in hopes of showing off his capabilities. McReynolds shuts him up with a solid bat, arguing once again that baseball Baseball is all about teamwork no matter how pro a player can be. The tension does not linger for long as the team proceeds with plays, especially with Pete Ward, a scout for the Cincinnati Reds, skillfully spies on their scrimmage. While Jake pitches for Brumley, Jay Niles approaches McReynolds. He compliments him on his hit, which McReynolds coolly takes. He forgives Niles' outburst, happy that the other is making an effort in caring about the team. McReynolds hits for Jake's pitches next, showing him the true competition of college baseball. After practice, the seniors perform their welcoming tradition for the newbies. They duct tape the freshman players onto the fence for batting practice. They then move along to swim in a river and get food from a cafeteria. Dale reminds the freshmen that despite being in a team, everyone is still out on their own at college. The seniors can do anything they want to do with the younger students, so it's time the freshmen toughen up mentally to succeed. News soon breaks that Willoughby is gone after the registrar discovered he forged his papers. This explains why the coach called him off the field. Willoughby, which is not even his real name, is actually a 30-year-old suspected of hopping around colleges and disguising himself as a college baseball player. Back at the baseball house, the boys are messing around again with Brumley as their main target. The discussion then steers towards Jake and his invitation to the theater major's party. They rope Jake into persuading them to come along with him to the party. At the venue, they ogle at the decorations highly unlikely to be found in a frat party. Beverly is dressed up as Alice for tonight. She catches sight of Jake and his friends, officially welcoming them to Oz. The jocks easily fit the scene, drinking, smoking, and snatching ladies' attention here and there. 
Beverly asks Jake to help her fill in a role for a short play, where he plays Mr. Rabbit, a bachelor in a matchmaking setting. After the party, Jake and Beverly take a walk outside. With only an hour before classes start, the two are lazily floating on swimming tubes by the river. They talk about their college applications and how Jake wrote an essay about the Greek myth of Sisyphus, relating it to his life as a student and baseball player focused on whatever life throws his way. Beverly expresses she feels the same way, simply participating in life as a performing arts student. They soak in the philosophy of their talk. Until Beverly confesses she likes Jake. Jake replies he likes her too, and they share a kiss. They return to Beverly's apartment so she could change clothes and get ready for the first day of class. They walk back to campus together, sealing their plans to meet up later with a sweet kiss. After Beverly leaves for her class, Dale and Finn cheer for him before making their way to their respective classes. Jake finds Plummer in his lecture hall, and they chuckle at the prospect of the good things the year has in store for them. Subscribe for more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like. It really helps the channel.